Welcome to Sweetwater County, the high desert adventure headquarters of Southwest Wyoming. From running with the wild horses and experiencing the history of the West to enjoying world-class fishing and viewing the reminders of this one-time Jurassic Park, you can come to forget, but you will leave and remember forever. Sweetwater County along I-80 in Southwest Wyoming. Hi, I'd like to welcome you to Western Wyoming Community College here in Rock Springs, Wyoming. We're just off I-80 and we have the largest collection of easily accessible dinosaurs along the whole of I-80 from Chicago to San Francisco. I'm Charlie Love. I teach geology here at Western Wyoming Community College. And right behind me is one of our more spectacular specimens of our entire museum exhibit. It is the classic Tyrannosaurus rex. This is actually a cast of one that was found and put together by the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He comes from three different specimens, one of which came from northeastern Wyoming, the other two of which came from eastern Montana, and they all come out of the same sedimentary beds. He's about 70 million years old and had to have at one time been the scourge of what would have been the plains eroding off the Rockies in those days. What's really fascinating about this guy is that he has at least five different broken ribs, broken while he was alive and healed while he was alive as well, suggesting that they had a behavior that was a little bit different than we might otherwise believe. Why? Because either they were defending themselves or in going after their prey, which we'll talk about later, uh, they got into trouble. We have found teeth marks on the backs of Triceratopsis, suggesting that there was some kind of connection between the hunting style of these Tyrannosaurus rexes and the animals they were going after. Their teeth, of which there are a great many, were constantly growing in the jaw. So they would grow up, get used up, and fall out. He had a continual set of teeth. I'm kind of envious of that, actually. I could use a new set now. At any rate, you can see the tiny little front legs, you can see the massive hind legs, and immediately behind me is this chunk of pelvis that he rested on, very much the same way that a cat rests when he crouches. He's down on his stomach and it can, can leap from a crouching position into a running position. Tyrannosaurus rex could do the same thing, albeit not quite as fast as a cat could do it. Now, when we were putting this, this animal up, uh, we were a little bit afraid of, of how people would view it because when we, he was disassembled and we had him on the floor of a lab, when we would bring little children in, they would be confronted by this massive jaw that you see up here. And some of them, if they were three or four years of age, would burst into tears. Well, if there's a single piece of the Tyrannosaurus Rex people want to see, it is the head. And so we put ours down low the whole animal in a running position, not unlike that of a chicken, and that way you can see literally all parts of it. But we were afraid, heaven forbid, being on a college campus, that there might be someone who was uh, inebriated somehow, they wouldn't otherwise normally be that way, and might want to hang from the jaws that you see up here. So what we did was to counterbalance him with an extra 200 pounds of lead up here in the tail so that in case there were an accident, uh, one, you couldn't pull him over and nobody would be hurt. The base, you can see, is a representation of a contour map. And that's why we have all these lines and we have these plants inside of which are the supports for the entire structure. So it's really kind of an interesting display in an oven by itself. It's very difficult for you to be able to see the support system in here. We wanted it that way. This magnificent specimen of a Triceratops came from eastern Wyoming originally. Although this is a cast, it is a cast of one of the finest specimens that the American Museum of Natural History in New York has. This thing is one of some 33 different Triceratopses that have been found in eastern Wyoming. And it's an amazing, amazing specimen because these are the great shielded variety of them. They have enormous horn cores. We do not know for sure how long the actual horn was because very much like a cow's horn, the horn is longer than the bone horn core that you have on the inside. Now, the teeth of this animal 
and the snout of it, as you can see, is more like a bird beak than anything else, and must have had a very, very sharp beak, because as near as we can tell, it fed off palm fronds. Palm leaves are some of the coarsest vegetation that you can possibly imagine. And this is why this animal is as big as it is. It is in kind of a crouched, defensive position. And we know that it could actually stand this way, but it didn't walk this way. And what happened was, they, it, when they originally reconstructed this one, they did it in a reptilian position with the arms out kind of on the elbow to the side. In reality, both of these front legs were underneath the animal, so the whole head would be four feet higher, and it would stand very much like an elephant. One of the amazing things about this animal is this gut because if he ate palm fronds, he had to be able to digest that kind of fiber. It's a phenomenal problem trying to digest palm fiber. And this is why this Triceratops happens to have such a huge gut on him. There are at least two cubic yards of space on the inside here. What his stomachs, and I do mean stomachs, plural, uh, allowed him to do was to ferment those palm leaves. And that fermentation process takes quite a while. End result is he gets the nutrition out of it by a bacterial fermentation process instead. And eventually it exits. And so much for the fermentation of the inside of this gut. Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about the pelvis of this guy. Because in Wyoming, where we have found 32 different specimens, we have a number of pieces of pelvis that show special scrape marks. The scrape marks are from the teeth of some carnivore or some kind of uh, uh, scavenger, and they show the serration on the edge of the teeth. They exactly match the Tyrannosaurus rex and those teeth. And we have even found Tyrannosaurus rex teeth associated with fossilized skeletons of these Triceratopses. So here in Wyoming, we have a connection showing that the Tyrannosaurus rex fed one way or another, either as a scavenger or as a predator, on the uh, Triceratopses. This is one of our most spectacular specimens. This is a plesiosaur. This is a marine reptile. It is not a dinosaur and they actually evolved twice in geologic history. Uh, once in Triassic time, then they became extinct, and then a second time in Jurassic and Cretaceous time. This happens to be a Cretaceous one and is about 70 million years old. The original specimen was found in southeastern Colorado, and the original one from which this cast was made uh, is in the Denver Museum of Natural History. This thing is spectacular for all kinds of reasons. First of all, we've set it up so that it is not hung from the ceiling along with all the flying reptiles. We've put it down in a bed of seagrass that you see right here. Fascinating kind of thing. When they're little kids, I always do this because it makes them jump when you let it go like that after a little bit. Now this animal fed obviously on fish, look at the teeth, and you can see some replicas in metal of these fish that it actually went after. These are Cretaceous fish, and you can see that there are two of them here in amongst the seagrass, but I want you to notice the neck, because you notice the neck is art like it was going to be a Loch Ness Monster style, but it could not be a Loch Ness Monster, and I will show you why. What I want to show you now is why this is not a Loch Ness Monster type. The plesiosaur is a marine reptile, and he's got a couple of really interesting features. One of the ones is this stuff right here. This is called the neural spine, and he's got more than 22 feet of neck. And the problem is here, he can't raise his head above the water very far, because in all of the artist's reconstruction of the Loch Ness Monster, you get a gooseneck, sort of like that. These neural spines, will knock together. There's no space in between them. And if you look along the, the length of this neck, then you only begin to get space way up there where they're tiny ones, and they are recurved just a little bit, so he could put his head above the water only a couple of feet, like that. And we have him in a position where, as you notice the alignment of the neck, he's actually striking at these fish sideways, like a snake would. 
but not from the top down the way the artists have the Loch Ness Monster doing it. Now the other really interesting thing, there are mysteries about these things, folks, all the time. For example, if I were to give you a 10-foot length, length of hose and have you breathe through that 10-foot length of hose, you'd be dead in the next five minutes. You'd asphyxiate because you'd be breathing the same air over and over again in the 10 feet of hose. This guy has a 22-foot neck. How the heck did he get oxygen all the way down into his lungs fast enough to be able to stay alive? It's the same problem a giraffe has, because the neck is so long you wind up having a problem of getting enough oxygen. So there are mysteries here. How did they breathe? He has nostrils on the very tip end of his nose. End result is he had to be able to breathe fast enough and have enough air get down into his lungs to be able to maintain himself. Now here's another real interesting thing about plesiosaurs. They had an extra set of ribs very, very different. These are gastral ribs, stomach ribs, if you will, to help support the weight of this animal when he paddles with his huge flippers up on top of a sandbar and just waits there or rests there or winds up sleeping there, then he doesn't crush himself under his own weight. This is the problem that whales have when they beach themselves. They're so heavy, they don't have any gastral ribs to be able to support themselves on, and as a result, their very weight causes them to asphyxiate. They can't breathe in their lungs. This guy could do it, and that's because he had gastral ribs. Now, the next thing that this guy had, very, very different, is right up here. And this is his tail, short, stubby little thing. But one of the neat things about it is he could swish it from side to side like the tail of a fish, which a whale and a porpoise cannot do, or he can make it go up and down like this, which all animals that are air breathers have to do if they live in the sea. And as a result, all the mammals tend to have either flippers that come out flat like this or tails that come out flat like this. And as a result, they always can come up and get the air they need. This one can go either up and down or from side to side like a snake. Very different. He had those options. And that's because the tail is constructed in the fashion that it has. Muscles for going up and down, which are attached to these side, almost rib-like structures, and from side to side with these dorsal spines and ventral spines underneath. We call those things chevrons. And so the musculature of this guy was quite diverse, different than anything we have today. This is a stegosaur, and this one comes from Como Bluff, Wyoming, which was discovered back in the 1870s, shortly after they put through the Union Pacific Railroad. This is a very common dinosaur of Jurassic time, which means it's older than the other ones you've seen. This is about 145 million years old or so. We've got quite a number of them. The word stegosaur means roofed reptile and is referring to these gigantic plates that you have up on top. Real interesting character though, little bitty head, it had a little bitty snout that was used for nipping things. We think probably fruit or soft vegetation. It had jaw teeth, which it munched it up with, but they're a little bitty and a little bitty head as well, suggesting that whatever it ate, it was pretty soft stuff. Then it has the hands down here. These hands are unusual. Notice they got five fingers, several digits on each one. These are specialized, probably for being able to half climb up a tree and picking fruit or whatever the soft vegetation is that it needs and or pulling a branch down and munching it off, nipping it off with his little nippers like so. And again, a little bit like some of the other dinosaurs, quite a large size body cavity on this one like so. But the, the part that has been the most mysterious are these huge bony plates. There have been controversies about those bony plates. Were they, and they thought all reptiles were cold-blooded, not warm-blooded, were these a heating device? which if he oriented himself towards the sun in the early morning, he would warm up faster and become more active as the case may be. But then there's the other side. Maybe he was warm-blooded instead, and these are a cooling device by being able to pump blood up in there and use it as a radiator. Or could it be both? 
Good question. We're not sure, but if on, you, on the edges of these plates, sometimes when you look real closely, you'll see they're absolutely crisscrossed by blood veins. And so it suggests that there's something to do with the control of temperature, one direction or another, with these great big plates. Also, they were mobile. They could lie down flat like that and protect the animal from carnivores. This guy had to have an extra, it was called a brain long, long ago, but it's not. It's an enlarged neural ganglion that is right smack dab in the inside of the vertebrae of the pelvis. It's an enlargement. It's about that big around, about the size of a big grapefruit, and apparently was used for coordination. It's not a thinking brain. Unlike the one in the head, which was a little bit larger than the size of a walnut, maybe more like a lemon, that did the thinking and the decision making, this did some of the coordinating of the animal uh, backside. Now of interest is that his feet on the hind side have only three toes. Not at all like what the front uh, limbs do. And as a result, we know this one was not used for the kinds of manipulative uh, muscular endeavors that you would have on the front end. Anytime you have all five fingers, you got a specialization taking place. When you start losing toes, then you don't need them quite so much. And on the very tail end, notice that he has these huge neural spines again, and the ventral chevrons as we call them. He could whip his tail back and forth sideways like that. Not so much up and down, doesn't have so many muscles for that, but why would he want to go sideways? Well, every school child knows that a stegosaur has got spines on the end of his tail. Obviously, these are for defense. He can protect himself. And with the huge musculature for being able to move his tail side by side, undoubtedly, this was a formidable weapon. But he didn't eat whatever he stuck with these things. He doesn't have the head, the mouth, or the teeth for it. Entirely vegetarian, this has got to be solely for defense. Now, I very often tell people this fish we caught on a six-pound test line down at Flaming Gorge, but obviously it's not. This is about 70 million years old and is a saltwater fish, not a reservoir fish by any means. And this is one of about half a dozen uh, that are on display in the world. This one is the second longest one at 15 feet uh, 6 inches. And he's a spectacular fish, putting it mildly. It comes from extreme western Kansas and lived at the same time as did the Tyrannosaurus rex and the Triceratops. Now this fish filled an ecologic niche probably not unlike that of the great white shark today. This swam off the coast of Rock Springs about 70 million years ago and at the time coal was being deposited in the mangrove swamps that were rock springs which ultimately fed the engines of the Union Pacific. This was just off the shore, patrolling back and forth. We have even found vertebrae from this fish uh, not five miles from where you're standing right now. This fish also, we can see, uh, occupied oceans that had sharks in them and that is because there are two sharks teeth on top of this the skeleton of this fish. When it died, it laid down in the lime mud of eastern Kansas. Sharks apparently patrolled above it, lost their teeth, as sharks do, and the sharks' teeth rained down on top of the specimens. And as a result, when you look closely and use your brochure, you will be able to see the sharks' teeth on this. Now.